your seats. Wonderful. Just before we come to the Word of God, is there Grace and James in? Where's Grace and James? Are they in? Come on, quickly, run up. Come on. Why don't you say hi to a couple of my friends? Oh, church, either clap or don't, but don't after it. Come on. Brilliant. This is Grace and James, and they are relatively new to Kings. And uh, next Sunday after church, I'm going to marry them uh, in, in Wigan. And um, they, they've only been in Kings a few weeks. And in fact, Grace has only been in the UK uh, for just a couple of months from Nigeria. So I wanted to introduce you because I like showing off my friends. So this is... James, this is Grace. They're part of our church here at King's. So I want you to get to know them. And next Sunday is their big day. They had a wedding in Nigeria that I watched on video. I did like the Nigerian wedding. I've got to tell you. Because people just danced around Grace throwing money at her. <laughs> so listen, I'm getting a Nigerian passport. And me and you, baby, we're getting married again. Uh, if it were both, they'd be throwing coins at you, wouldn't they? Like, But listen, so let's just uh, stretch out your hand as we pray for them. Father, thank you for James and Grace. We pray um, that you will bless them in their married life together. We thank you for bringing them to the UK. We thank you for bringing them to our church family here at King's. We pray they will feel really part of who we are and that you will just help them to grow and develop into the fullness of the potential that you see within them. Thank you for them. May they have a great final week before they get married. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much, James and Grace. Okay, wonderful to see it. Well, summer in the Psalms. We've had another week of 40 degree weather. Uh, you're looking suntanned. You're looking like you've had a great time. Barbecues. So, summer in the Psalms. Last week we talked about. Uh, Psalm 27, and if you remember, we talked about the difference between the internal and the external. Though an army besiege me, external, my heart will not fear internal. Though war break out against me, external, even then will I be confident internal. And we talk about that complexity that David talked about in Psalm 27. We are going to this morning, in the time that we have, move on to another Psalm, Psalm 40. Uh, which is also a psalm of David, but he wrote this in different moments in his life. You know, one thing I love about the psalms is it's got the highs and the lows. It doesn't pretend. It's not a PR for God, because there are some psalms where people are saying, God, where are you? I don't feel you. I don't think you're there. There are some psalms that says, I'm giving up. You've left me. Well, that's not very positive, is it? So, Oh, we have to ask, what is this psalm? Remember last week I taught you, whenever you read scripture, three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? And what's it got to do with me? So this morning, ask yourself the question uh, the, on this text. What does it say? What does it mean? And thirdly, probably the final part is, what has it got to do with me? So let's read Psalm 40 together. Now, Psalm 40 is 17 verses, and we haven't got time in 30 minutes to do 17 verses. So we're going to do Psalm 40, and I'm just going to do the first three verses. And it says on the screen, this is what David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my heart, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Three verses. Psalm 40 was written not in the same condition David was in in his life that he wrote Psalm 27. Psalm 40 is basically David looking back on his life, recognizing that God kept bringing him through. You know, sometimes when you are facing a trial in your future, the answer is not 
trying to make it up. It's looking in your past and saying, God, you brought me through then. 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 You're going to be bringing me through now. And so David is kind of Psalm 40, looking back, saying, God, this is what I know. This is what I've experienced. This is not something that I've just casually read. This is something that has been forged. This theology has been forged in me with the trials of life. So let's take these three verses one at a time. Verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. Now, if there's ever an oxymoron, waited patiently is an oxymoron. An oxymoron is like two things that just don't fit together. Like Scottish football. <laughs> military intelligence. It just, they, just, they just don't work. To, just, just waited, waited patiently. Does God understand? Waited patiently. And you know what human waiting is like. Um, I was in Morrison's. Georgina texted me on the way home uh, a few months ago. And we were having something for tea. And she texted me. She said, will you get this? I forgot it. So I ran into Morrison's. Morrison's is terrible uh, if you only want one thing. And I refuse. Categor it's biblical. Leviticus 46. I refuse to go to the self-service tills. I'm not doing it. Because you think you get through, and then you do it, and it says, put it in the bag, and you haven't got a bag, and then the red light goes, and it takes some poor lady on minimum wage 40 minutes to get to you. So I want somebody who will beat me. I want a conveyor belt, and I want somebody who will serve me, somebody that I can talk to. I want human. So I, I stood at the tills, and I was checking them all out, as you do. Who's got least in the basket? Who's, who's, and and I, I'm weighing it up, and I'm doing a weighing up, and I think, there. That woman's only got a hand basket. So I ran and got behind her. And then the woman on the till said, sorry, we're closing. And then I looked back and all the others had got loads of people. And I went, you could have told me. I've been here four seconds. So went back. And then you do this, because I know how you hate waiting patiently like I do. I was stood behind a woman that was buying like the whole of Morrison's. And I had like pineapple chunks because we were having gammon. Oh no, pineapple rings, rings, because we were having gammon and it's the law. And I, I thought, how can I do this? So I gave her my me, me best look. Like a henpecked husband on the way home from. I gave her that and she looked at me. She turned around, wasn't even interested. So I went again. I coughed and banged a trolley and went, oh. <laughs> and then she said those words that came from heaven. Do you want to go in front of me? I said, yes, Lord, I do. Went in front of her. But waiting patiently. I mean, what, God, are you for real? David, you, I, I waited patiently. You see, there is a difference when we talk about the Bible context of waiting and our frustrated waiting. You see, this is a description of how David waited, not how long he waited. The promises of God are often seen through the generation, not the 15 minutes that we want it. The promises of God are not slot machines, where you put your pound in, you pull the lever, bang, 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 bang. The promises of God have got to be worked in you and through you. The promises of God are not instantaneous. They're not rewards, they're not trophies, they're not gifts. The promises of God, and listen, get this right, are fruit. They're fruit of a decision that every one of us in here makes. And the decision is this, to believe. That's the fruit of, of the promises of God. The promises of God are not for those that don't believe. I mean, you read scripture all the time. It talks about those that 
believe. John 1, 12 says, to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Our job is not to understand it all. Our job is not to work it out. Our job is to believe it. And David understood this because he said, I waited patiently. I am going to hang in here. I'm going to hang around long enough till I see the promises of God worked out through me. Some of us are in that process of waiting, aren't we? But when we are waiting, you've got to understand that God is working. Let me tell you about waiting on the Lord and waiting on each other. I have got one very beautiful wife. She tells me it takes time to be that beautiful. And uh, over our 30, nearly our 33 years of marriage, one of the biggest tensions in our married life that it took me 20 years to crack was this. How long it takes Georgina to get ready and how long it takes Derek to get ready. So I get out of bed, run in the shower, put a comb through my hair, three minutes, I'm in the car, pipping the arm. Georgina, however, takes a little longer. And because, and men sympathize with me, uh, because we don't know what they do, it's a mystery. I've searched the scriptures. I've been to Leviticus. I don't know what women do getting ready, but it takes a long time. And then we had a daughter called Abigail, uh, Georgina, Mark 2. She takes twice as long as her mother. I remember seriously. We'd be in our house and I'd be saying to Abigail, what, 10 o'clock in the morning, what are you doing today, darling? She said, I'm getting ready. I said, oh, where are you going? Oh, I've got a, a party tonight. I said, love, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. She said, I've got to get ready. What do women do? And the amount of time I've stood at the bottom of our stairs saying, Georgina, how long will you be? Because I don't get what she's doing. So I've learned. Because I'm a good husband. So when I ask her, George, give me an ETA. I'll work to your time. Tell me when. So she tells me, I say, okay. So I'll go out for a run, have a shower, watch a film, <laughs> cut the grass, wallpaper the back bedroom, and, uh, and then I meet her at the bottom of the stairs, and she comes down like pretty woman. Now listen, David wasn't waiting for a wife who he didn't know what was doing. You see, what you've got to do, in the waiting, God is working. In the waiting, God is working. And I'm frustrated. Georgina, come on, we've got it. But in the waiting, God is working. In fact, in the waiting, God is not getting himself ready. God's getting you ready. In the waiting, God is working something in you. Because patience is not a gift of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And this is the weird thing about stuff like patience. You only get patience by enduring times when you struggle to be patient. So in the waiting, in the impatience of our life, God is not working on him being ready. He's already ready. It's you either and already. So God is working something in us through patience so that we can be ready for the opportunities. And David, I think he understood this. I waited patiently for the Lord. And you may be in here this morning or watching online and you're thinking, you know, I, I'm going through some stuff, God, and it doesn't seem to be happening as quickly as I wanted. Well, in the waiting, your job is this. Shut up and believe. Believe. You know why we were called believers in Scripture? Because they believed. The secret's on the tin. Believers are called to believe. So we've got to believe the promises of God when we don't see the promises of God because in the waiting, God is working. I love the fact that when I'm frustrated, he's working. When I'm annoyed that it's not going as quick as I want it to, he's working. When I'm like struggling, thinking, God, this should have happened quicker. He is working. But he's not just working up there. He's working in here, in the waiting. So David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. 
And then he says this, he turned to me and he heard my cry. I waited patiently for the Lord. That's what, but he turned to me. And I thought to myself, why would God need to turn to you? Did he have his back to you? You see, if I turn to you, it's because I wasn't attentive to you. I had my back to you. So the, to be honest, I don't want to get into arguments about verses, verses of the Bible. But the NIV translates this pretty lousy. It's not he turned to me. It's the word is better. He inclined to me. The King James Version says he inclined to me. Now, when you incline, it simply means it's to bend over. In other words, when God heard your cry, he inclined. He bent over to you. We've got a granddaughter. The minute I walk into the room and she's sat on the floor, I'm over there and I incline. I bend over. It's not that God is turning to you because he wasn't paying attention. It's that God, he inclined to me. And he heard my cry. Let me tell you this morning, definitely, 100%, God hears your cry. And not just when we cry out in church in worship, but when you cry at home, when you're in bed, when nobody sees the tears and nobody sees the angst, God hears your cry. And instead of stepping away from you, he steps to you. We've all had people in our life, in moments when we've needed them, we haven't been there, haven't we? In moments when we've fallen apart, they like back off because they don't want to be associated with that. I've had that many times too. Let me tell you, that's exactly the opposite of what God does. When you're in trouble, he inclines to you. He's like this, tell me. He bends. John 1.14 says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. You know what that is? It's God getting involved. It's God bending. It's God coming out of heaven into this sin sick world. The word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only that comes from the Father, full of grace and truth. He didn't turn to you, he inclined to you. God bends to listen to you. Speak, say something. God hears your cry. I don't know about you when, <laughs> I have to tell you this. I've been praying for something for many years, and I've just got it. When I was 15, I had a Lambretta. It wasn't registered with anybody. My mum and dad didn't know because I kept it in Nigel Forrest's garage on Ladybirds. But I had a Lambretta. I had no helmet, no, no insurance, no MOT, and drove it around Ladybirds like a lunatic in the evenings. And uh, one day, it got confiscated by a policeman called... John Bulpit, and he was a big dude. He was like policemen should be made. Six foot odd, hard as nails, and he took me and, and, took, and he crushed it. And so I've had this bitterness for him being 15 that I've had to. And just recently, age 57, I've decided I've, I've done enough to be worthy of a midlife crisis. So Derek Smith now owns a, La, a Lambretta, a 1971 original 156, and I have passed my, no, don't get, it gets better, it gets better. So my Lambretta's in my garage, and I've passed my bike test, and I am now going to terrorize Bolton. But I thought, you can't go halfway, can you? You can't go halfway, so I looked online, and I bought myself a Parker. <laughs> I was so excited. You have not seen any. So I bought this Parker online, and, and it says, parcel tracking. I watched it every day. It's like, it's at the depot. It's in the van. He's on his way. He's left, the, he's left Stoke-on-Trent. It's now at Manchester. It's now at Presswich. He's coming down my road. <laughs> the promises of God don't come with... Promise tracking. You don't know how near they are. You just don't know. So your job, my job, is not to presume. So I, I'm so excited. And the minute I've got, I've got my helmet, I'm insured now. It's all legal. But I'm going to be driving around Brightman, causing trouble. No, I'm beating up rockers, going to Brighton on Bank Holiday Mondays. But I want to I, I just say to you, the promises of God are not trackable you've got to 
can't, you can't track them, but they are trustable. And we've got to trust God with what we can't see when it comes to his promises. So he, then he goes on to verse 2, it says this. Bang the whole, tech, uh, the whole verse up, please, if you wouldn't mind. He says this, verse 2. He lifted me out of a slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. This is my experience of, of being in church for 38 years, is this. And in some form of leadership for probably 36 of those 38 years. My experience is this, the gospel lifts people. No, no listen, I don't think you got it. The gospel lifts people. It lifts people out of debt, if you do it right. It lifts people out of brokenness. It lifts people out of anxiety. It lifts people out of all kinds of stuff that are just like mud and mire. Now, when David wrote this, you've got to realize this. He wasn't picturing like, um, uh, uh, he, he's a, he was a shepherd. So when he says, he lifted me out of a slimy pit, what, what was he thinking a slimy pit was? Well, let me tell you what David was talking about. He was talking about when he was a shepherd boy, sheep, the dozy animals, would fall into pits. And his job as the shepherd was this, to get the sheep out of the pit. So this is what a shepherd would do. He would climb into the pit, put the sheep across his shoulders and climb out of the slimy pit carrying the sheep. You know, you've seen those pictures on stained glass windows of Jesus and he's in a nighty. He's got a halo. He's white because he was from Bolton. <laughs> he's blonde there because he's had it bleached. And he's got a lovely lamb around his shoulder. That wasn't the picture. The lamb would have been covered in mud and poo and everything because it had been stuck in a pit for weeks. And David knew his job was to pick up his tunic and tuck it in, jump down or climb down into the mire, into all the mud, because this sheep was dead if this sheep didn't get out. Had no ability to climb out. And he would put this sheep on his shoulders and he would climb out. So when David penned this, he lifted me out of the slimy pit. He was talking about salvation a thousand years before Jesus even walked the planet. It was almost picturing. He was articulating this. Let me tell you, friends, this year. Jesus lifted you out of a slimy pit. Now, you may, have, you may be a nice middle-class person who lives in a nice part of town with 2.4 children and two cars and a dog and a holiday home. Let me tell you where you were. You were in a pit. You were lost. You were separated from God. You may have had money in the bank, but nothing in the bank of heaven. And according to the Bible, without Christ, we are bound for a lost eternity. Everybody's in a pit. Now, some people's pit looks obvious. And some people's pit looks nicer. But everybody before Jesus is in a pit. And here David is saying, he lifted me out of the pit, out of the mud and the mire. We're living in a world that's never been more technological. But fear, anxiety, addiction, brokenness, hopelessness, lack, confusion, strife, comparison, doubt, unforgiveness. Do I need to go on? It's created a pit. And when we see people in our world, they may have money. They may drive a nice car. But in their hearts, when you meet people, it's a pit. So a thousand years before Jesus, David, in describing what God had done for him, described salvation pretty good, I think. He lifted me out of a slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. All the things we get caught up in life. He lifted me. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus heals a young man that has a demon. And in Mark 9, 26, he says this. As Jesus prayed for him, the spirit inside him shrieked, convulsed him, and violently came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. Verse 27, but Jesus took him by the hand and he lifted him to his feet and stood up. Let me tell you, friends of the jury today, if you don't know Jesus, and I'm saying this as humbly as I can because I love you. If you don't know Jesus, you are the living dead. You may breathe, 
and blood may f- flow through the, the, the arteries in your body, but according to Scripture, you are the living dead, and Jesus wants to come into your situation, incline himself, climb into the pit, and lift you out of the pit, all the mud and the mire. So where does he lift us to? Well, the next bit of us too, bang it back on the screen, please, it's on. He set my feet upon a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. I want you to picture David covered in mud. King David, not yet king, covered in mud, covered in sheep poo. You can't see his wonderful robes. You can't see, he's just absolute mess. And he's got a half dead sheep wrapped round his, round his neck that he's climbed out of a pit. And then he takes the sheep and he thinks to himself, you're not going back in there. So he puts the sheep and he finds the sheep somewhere where the sheep can stand up, where it's a safe place for the sheep. That's exactly what salvation does for us. It not only lifts us out of the mire, but it gives us a place where we can stand that's strong. Build your life on your mortgage rate. Really? Build your life on politics. Really? Build your life on public opinion. Build your life on your job title. Build your life on any title. Build your life on your health. Build your life on all the stuff that's very, very changeable. So Jesus didn't put the sheep up and put him in a place of danger. He, he gave him a firm place to stand. Let me tell you, there is no better place. There is no better place to be. There's no more secure place to be. There's no, there's no place in the world more secure to be the right in the middle of where God wants you. We stood on the rock Christ Jesus this morning. My, my faith's not linked to the interest rates. My faith's not linked to who's in. Because to be honest, you know what? I have political opinions. But Labour, Tory, Lib Dem, for me, they're all crooks. I don't expect politics to change my life. I expect Jesus to change my life. And so we've, we, 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 we've got to realize that God has given us a firm place to stand. And we're living in a system where maybe not every, every person is bad because some are not. But the system is so shakable. It's so easily messed with. It's no wonder if you've attached yourself to things that are so changeable. Your life is up and down. You're like on, uh, you, you, your spiritual life is like a ride at Alton Towers. It's up and it's down. It's up and it's down. Because it's not on anything solid. You know, I don't, about being, I don't mean about being miserable and we shall not be moved. I, I, I want you to be emotional about God. Of course do. But I want you to know where you have placed your feet this morning. Goes on to say in verse 3, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Can I ask you a question this morning? Because David asked a question. What's on the playlist of your mind? We've got Alexa at home. She's brilliant. And um, because she does as she's told. And uh, I just say, Alexa, play. And Alexa plays what I ask her to play. And, you know, I get up in the morning sometimes and I sometimes say, Alexa, play Christian worship and she'll play something. But sometimes I get up and I'm in a bad mood. Alexa, play the jam. 1984 album. And what's, the pl- what's playing? What's the soundtrack to your life? If there was an album title to the soundtrack of your experience, what would it be? Matt Lawson's might be Pet Shop Boys, It's a Sin. (laughs) Everything I've ever done, everything. Maybe not. What's yours? Because I think David, listen, David here links, verse 2 to verse 3, he links what God has done for you 
linked to what comes out your mouth. Don't tell me you're spiritual if nonsense comes out your mouth. Don't tell me you know Jesus. And you, you, no, 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 not if what's coming out your mouth is garbage because the Bible says the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And here David says this, all what God's done, lifted me out of the mud and the mire, it says this, uh, if I'm playing, play, he put a new song in my mouth. Because the song out the pit is a different song to the song in the pit. And if you've, you've not changed your song, my dad used to say this um, when I got annoying, which was occasionally true, or I kept going on. He'd say things like this, will you change the record? What he meant was, I'm going on, I'm my, dad wants a skateboard. Why? Because it's 1974 and I want a skateboard and I want a skateboard. Will you change the record? In other words, you're just so obsessed and picked with this one thing. So what's the song that's in your heart right now? And I, it, I've got to be honest, sometimes in my own life, the song that has come out of my heart has been, woe is me for I am undone. Yeah. But God wants a new song. Change the record. If you're not happy with the outcome, change the record. When people become Christians, let me give you a tip. 38 years of ministry. When people become Christians, this is what I look for first. Not that they change the way they dress and they don't, you know, instead of Led Zeppelin t-shirts, it's now the choir or something. I don't know. I was trying to think of something contemporary Christian. Could think about it. First thing, they used to smoke and now they stopped smoking. I don't, I, listen, I don't care whether you smoke. You don't, it's not a spiritual thing. It's just a health thing. Smoking won't send you to hell, but it might send you to heaven a bit sooner. So listen, I, all that stuff is like, it's irrelevant. I'll tell you what I look at when somebody confesses faith. What comes out their mouth? Let me read what James said to you in the New Testament. With a tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. You cannot be a spiritual Christian with garbage in your mouth. Because if there's garbage coming out of your mouth, guess, let me tell you where it came from. It came from your heart. Because of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. He put a new song. Listen, this morning, we're not talking about just a new, sing a new song. We're talking about a whole new way of language, a whole new way of articulating things. That God is my provider. He's my, he's my banner. That God is good. That God is, is perfect. That God is for me. That if God be for me, who can be against me? He said, why me, why me, why me, why me? It concludes with this, second part of verse 3. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. One of the biggest evangelistic things we can ever do is live consistently for Jesus. Now, I'm not against proclamation and shouting it from the rooftop. I'm not against the man on the square with a cross talking to people about Jesus. Listen, by all means, win some. But I'll tell you what's the most effective evangelistic tool God has. It's a man or a woman that knows where they were and knows now where they are, that knows what God has done, that knows where God has brought them, that knows where God has put them, that knows that God's put a new song in their mouth. Because when the world looks at that, they say, how, how did you do that? What got you through that cancer? What got you through that divorce? What got you through that when your children were ill? What got you through miscarriage? What got you through all the redundancies you went through? What got you through when your business went bust? What got you through? Well, I know who I am. I know where I was. I know where God's brought me. I know where God's put me. And I know he's put a new song in my mouth. Any questions? 
we've only got time for three. There's another 15, 14. I waited patiently for the Lord. For God. For God, while you're waiting, he's working. He turned to me. He inclined to me. He knelt down. He stretched his arms. And he heard my cry. He lifted me out this slimy pit of middle-class hopelessness. He lifted me out this slimy pit of alcohol addiction that had ruined my family. He lifted me out this slimy pit of, of, of inappropriate sex or anything that is life. He lifted me out the pit of the drug of money. Our world is not just full of down and outs, it's full of up and outs. To hold good jobs and drive nice cars and they're dead to the things of God. And he put a new song in my mouth. A hymn of praise to our God and many are going to see in fear and put their trust in God because of you. Let me say this, I'm commissioning you this morning. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're the best evangelist Kings has got. This isn't evangelism. You're the evangelist. And you're the evangelist. And you're the evangelist. And you're the evangelist. And people sat over here, you're the evangelist of your world. I'm, I'm not touching your world. But many will see and put their trust in God because they looked at you and you knew where I've come from, what I've been brought through, where God's put me. And he's put a new song in my mouth. I wish I could keep preaching, but time's gone. Three verses is enough. Don't be greedy. We'll hit the Psalms again next week for our Summer in the Psalms, part three. But we're going to conclude our service with communion. I, I always forget to say this, but the gluten-free us, you're here. I'm making no more comments because I got in trouble the last comment I made last time. Jesus loves people that are gluten-free. So the gluten-free people, this, this has been done for you. But as we come out in a few moments, I'm going to ask the rest of the band to join me. This is what I want you to do. Because... This could be a nip and a sip. It could be. How many times have some of us done this? Bit of bread, bit of juice. But this is what I want you to do this morning. I want you to come out. Thanking God that you're not in a pit anymore. And if you're struggling to believe that, this is what I want you to do as you walk out. I want you to feel like you're on the shoulders of Jesus. Because you might be in the pit, but he's not. And if you stick with him, you're coming out that pit. Just hold on. And as we come out and as we take this bread, we take this juice, which is just symbolic, I want you to know everything to get you from where you were to where you need to be has been paid for in the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Given. It's not just so that we could go to heaven when we die, as good as that is, but it's also we could bring heaven to a fallen, messed up, confused world. I don't believe eternal life happens at my funeral. I believe eternal life happened in December 1984 when a 19-year-old Derek Smith said, knowing nothing, yeah? Not having a clue what that yeah would mean for me. Not having a clue that it would drastically change everything about the rest of my life. So I want you to come out filled with gratitude and then go back to your seats and then we're just going to pray one more thing and then... Rachel's going to come and tidy the service up and then you can get on the sunbeds.
sun cream barbecue this afternoon. It's going to be a hot one and pray and believe him. Close your eyes with me for one moment. Father, we thank you that everybody in this room who knows you has been lifted out of a pit. God, it's no point arguing, well, my pit was nicer than your pit. A pit's a pit. And it's full of all things that make us dirty and get us entangled and confused and messed up. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that when you came into this world, you didn't come into triumph. You got into the humanity's pit. You saw the dirt and the mire. You met people. But God, you didn't leave us in the mess that we were in. Because three days after your death on a Roman cross, God raised Jesus from the dead. That all who believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. All that believe in him have the ability to get on his shoulders and be lifted out the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock. Thank you, God, whether the people in this room today who've been on this journey for 50, 60 years or people that the journey is just going to begin today. Thank you for everything that you are doing in our church. In Jesus' name. So we're just going to ask the band to play quietly in the background. The communion tables are open. There'll be some leaders that will help you. Come, do it worshipfully, but do it thankfully of what God has saved you from and what God has saved you to. Come on, let's take communion as a family together.